Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the All Things Phil broadcast. I'm William Bell, and we are returning to bring another lesson on the Holy Spirit. We have been talking about the Holy Spirit and sharing some messages regarding the work of the Holy Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit, so that we can understand how this member of the Godhead worked within that first century time frame to bring about the consummation of all things during that interim of Jesus' going away and his return. And we left off in the previous lesson discussing various facets of the end time that were being accomplished through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we encourage you to open your Bibles, open your minds, and open your hearts. And we trust that God will open your understanding to have a better grasp of the scriptures related to the Holy Spirit. So let's begin. We talked about the new heavens and the new earth, wherein righteousness dwells. Second Peter 3 and verse 13, and Galatians 5, 5, that says, For we through the Spirit do wait for the hope of righteousness, which is by faith. We talked about Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel prophesied that 70 weeks were determined upon the city and the sanctuary in order to bring in everlasting righteousness. And we show that that righteousness was a part of the work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 10, and that it was being carried out through the gospel that was being revealed by the Spirit within the first century generation. The second thing that we talked about, or at least uh, a second point that we made in the previous lesson, was that we talked about the judgment and how the Holy Spirit would also accomplish judgment through the defeat of Satan. Because Jesus had stated in John chapter 12 in the verses 31, now is the prince, or now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And we gave Romans 16 and verse 20 that says, and the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. And also Revelation 12 and verse 12, showing that Satan has been cast down knowing that he has a short time. All of those passages indicated the fact that the little while that Jesus spoke about in John 16, verses 16 through 19, was in progress during that first century time frame, and that it was not to be extended throughout several centuries, but only within a few decades. Then we talked about making an end of sins, the atonement. And we pointed out that this was the time of the coming of the Lord when he would turn ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant to them when I will take away their sins, Romans chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, a passage that clearly happens after Pentecost, but yet before and in connection with 70 A.D., in terms of the time it was written. Uh, it was written before 70 AD and thus fulfilled at that time. Uh, we also talked about the unclean spirit and the prophet passing out of the land. That prophecy and vision would be sealed up so that there would be no longer any need for divine revelation for the exercise of miraculous gifts for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, which has already been completed. And so today we're going to continue uh, a discussion on these matters that relate to the Holy Spirit. And the first of which we're going to talk about is the role of the Holy Spirit in the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Now the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, and the verse is 17. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Assuredly, I say to you, 
till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all these things be fulfilled. So Jesus tells us that the law would remain intact, that it would remain until all was fulfilled. And he marked out what meant or what he meant by fulfillment in saying that it was the heaven and the earth passing and also every jot and tittle of the law and the prophets. So we cannot assign the fulfillment of the law to any time that falls short of those requirements. Now, many people have sought to end the law at the cross when Jesus died on the cross, and they use various passages to assert that. But a deeper look at those passages demonstrates that that is not what they teach. And so this uh, doctrine has been perpetuated for years and continues to be perpetuated in the church and by many preachers, yet it is one that cannot be sustained or fulfilled or uh, defended. In addition, we also have the statements in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and the verses 18 that talk about the fulfillment of the law, the transition or the transformation from the one to the other. And before we look at that passage, we're going to look at just a couple of other texts. Uh, first of all, there is Hebrews chapter 8 and the verses 13, where the Hebrews writer, after having spoken of the new covenant that would come about, said, as he concludes his quote from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, saying, in that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now, that which is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, the Lord, or Paul, excuse me, did not say that the covenant had already passed at the time he wrote this. He said that it was growing obsolete. And now what had become obsolete and is growing old is ready, at hand, is nigh unto vanishing. The time for its disappearance had drawn near. Now, one of the reasons he said that is based upon Hebrews chapter 7 and the verses 11, which says, Therefore, if perfection went through or were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? You see, the Bible demonstrates that the law was based upon the priesthood. The priesthood was the foundation for the law. And you know that no building is any stronger than the foundation upon which it rests. And so what we have is the scriptures teaching us that the first covenant, the law, the Torah, rested upon the foundation of the Levitical priesthood. But then the Bible says in verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. So if you're going to change the law, it's necessary to change the priesthood as well, because law rests upon priesthood. And the change of the priesthood transferred from one tribe who had been responsible for the priestly things all the way through the 1,500 years of Moses' law to another tribe of which Moses had spoken nothing concerning priesthood. The Bible says, for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. But he says that this priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. 
And that has some very serious implications as well because Melchizedek predated the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek was greater than the Levitical priesthood. And that was evidenced by the fact that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blessed him. And the Bible says, the less is blessed of the better. So that means if Melchizedek blessed Abraham, then Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. But the scripture also says that Levi was in the loins of his father Abraham at the time Melchizedek blessed him. And the conclusion of Paul's logic is this, that Melchizedek blessed Levi also. And if that is the case, then Melchizedek is not only greater than Abraham, but because Levi was in the loins of Abraham and was blessed in Abraham, then Melchizedek is greater than him also. And so we have the supremacy and superiority of the new covenant over the old. And that's why, one of the reasons why, God changed that priesthood because perfection could never be achieved under that priesthood, and thus a new one had to take its place. And so the Bible talks about the transition from that priesthood. And that transition is seen in uh, many of these passages right here in Hebrews. But we have another text in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and the verses 18. And the reason why we are looking at this particular passage is because of the role of the Holy Spirit in bringing this change about. Now, this is very important because we pointed out the scope and duration of the work of the Holy Spirit that it was for a 40-year period, for the days as was Israel's coming out of the land of Egypt. And that being a 40-year period, the Bible is telling us that the work of the Holy Spirit related to these miracles that was accomplishing this end times process, this end times salvation, was for a period of 40 years. That's Micah 7 and verse 15. Now, to add a little bit of support to that, I would encourage you to look at Isaiah chapter 63, verses 18 and 19, that says, Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never rule, those who were never called by your name. But even before that, I want us to uh, back up to verse uh, 11. In verse 11, the scripture says, Then he remembered the days of old. Again, this is Isaiah 63 and verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? What is he speaking of? He's talking about the time that Moses delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt into the promised land. And at that time, God put his spirit within them. And the scripture says, who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the waters before them. See, these were these awesome and marvelous acts of the Holy Spirit during that 40-year wandering, to make himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they may not stumble. And so, verse 14, as a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. And when God delivered them, his name was glorious. As a matter of fact, the fame of God had gone all around to all the nations so that they knew of his fame even prior to the entrance of Israel into the promised land. And so we can see, therefore, which confirms the text in Micah chapter 7 and verse 15, that God was 
or gave the Holy Spirit to Moses in that day to lead them through a 40-year wandering and deliverance from the bondage of Egypt until they arrived in the land of Canaan. And it was on that day that they arrived in Canaan and ate of the produce of the land that the manna ceased. That is, God's miraculous bread from heaven ceased. So those were special miracles that were done for that period of time and were done within that framework of the first exodus. Now what we have in the New Testament is a second exodus. This is the true exodus from the bondage of sin and death. It is a an exodus that is led by Christ as opposed to Moses. And the two of those are contrasted in the book of Hebrews as a Moses being a servant in his house, whereas Christ being a son over his own house. But he says, whose house we are if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. That was written to those in the first century who were under the condition of remaining faithful, becoming the true house of God. Now, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and the verse is 18, this is talking about the transition from the old covenant. The Bible says in verse 17 and 18, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom from bondage, deliverance from the captivity of sin and death under the law. And so he says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And so, excuse me for that interruption. And so they were being transformed from glory to glory. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Notice, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the transformation from the old covenant, from that covenant that Israel broke from the Torah, from the law, was being done through the work of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we can see that, as Jesus said, not one jot or tittle would pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He gave the Holy Spirit in order that they could reach that time of fulfillment to complete all prophecy and all the way to the point of the destruction of the Jewish temple, which is called heaven and earth in the scriptures. So this passage is referring to that. Now let's look at another one that uh, pulls this together in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews the ninth chapter. And in that chapter, beginning at verse 8, after Paul had discussed the tabernacle, that is the two compartments of the tabernacle, first the earthly sanctuary, and then he goes on to talk about the heavenly sanctuary. All of these were types and shadows of the true sanctuary, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. But he says in verse seven, but into the second part of the uh, the high priest, rather, went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating This, that the way into the holiest of all, meaning the most holy place, that place behind the second veil where God's glory was seated above the mercy seat on his throne between the two cherubim, the scripture says that the way into the holiest of all is not made manifest while the first tabernacle is yet standing. So as long as that old covenant had a covenantal standing, and remember, not one jot or tittle could pass until all were fulfilled, 
as long as there was a jot and a tittle unfulfilled and which had not come to pass, the Bible says that that first tabernacle had a standing. And the significance of that is that it has a covenantal standing. It has a covenantal standing. Now watch verse 9. It is symbolic for the present time. That's the time of writing. We can't read a 21st century time frame into this because that would be a violation of the rules of hermeneutics and grammar. But he says, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered. You see, those gifts were still being offered at the time, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regards to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. And so those things were simply imposed for a time. And when that time of Reformation had consummated and come, then those things were done away. But that was being accomplished through the work of the Spirit. And so Peter uh, very clearly identifies the work of the Spirit when he talks about the, uh, the gospel and the fact that these things which were being revealed by the Spirit were uh, revealed by the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. He says these were things which the angels desire to look into. In 1 Peter 1, verses 9 through 11, or through 12, he says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what matter of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves. So again, these things weren't to be fulfilled in the times of the Old Testament prophets. But to us, that means in the lifetime of the apostles, in their generation, they were ministering the things which now, there's a temporal word indicating that it was for that present time in which Peter was penning these words, have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you, notice, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Sent from heaven by whom? Sent by Christ when he ascended up on high. Remember, he says, I will not leave you without a helper. I will come to you. It is to your advantage that I go away, because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. And so when Jesus ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit in his absence. And therefore, the scripture says, these things have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you with the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. And so uh, Peter is very, very um, clear about the fact that the Holy Spirit was revealing these things. Now, so when we talk about the law and the transition of the law into the new covenant, it has to be taken in connection with and in consideration of the work of the Holy Spirit within that first century generation. And the last point that I'd like to uh, bring out for today is the inheritance that was being accomplished through the Spirit. This, once again, identifies that the inheritance had to be received within the 40 years for that functional work of the Holy Spirit related to those miracles. And therefore, the Holy Spirit has accomplished that task, that work of bringing about the inheritance. Now, the Bible talks very clearly about the inheritance and the work of the Spirit. Uh, we have a text, for example, in Galatians, the third chapter, and the verses 14, that focuses on the role of the Spirit. Because he says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive 
the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, that promise is identified as the inheritance. Let's look further. The Scripture says in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, And to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. So we still have in sight here the promise that would be received through the Spirit. Now let's further identify what the promise is. The Scripture uses the word for in verse 18 to tell us specifically what the promise is. He says, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, God did not give Abraham the law, and therefore the promise cannot be of the law. What he gave to Abraham was the promise, and the law came 430 years after. But if he gave to Abraham the promise, then the scripture says, that the inheritance belongs to the promise. And thus he says, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was a or it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there could have been a law which could have given life Truly, righteousness would have been by the law. Now, that we understand that the promise was given to Abraham 430 years before the law, and therefore the promise is not the law, and the promise is not of the law, and the inheritance is not of the law, then we go to Ephesians in order to understand more about this promise. However, we are out of time. And we're going to have to continue this topic on the next or in the next broadcast where we're going to begin with the inheritance as it is stated in Ephesians to show the relationship of the Holy Spirit bringing about the inheritance and the promise that was made to Abraham. Because there is but one hope, there is but one promise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this broadcast today. And uh, we encourage you to share this message with your family and friends. Uh, Go ahead and subscribe. And we encourage you also to post it to your uh, various social media sites. We also would like to encourage you to get our book, which is titled, Have You Spoken in Tongues? And uh, when you purchase that book, for a very nominal price, you can reach, you can uh, obtain it by going to Amazon.com and just searching uh, for the title, Have You Spoken in Tongues? It's a book about the Holy Spirit that teaches you about the Holy Spirit and about the work of the Spirit, and especially uh, that work that related to various gifts that were mentioned in the Scriptures. Uh, it's available at Amazon.com, and we encourage you to take advantage of that book. And we also look forward to seeing you back in our next broadcast. Uh, We want to thank you once again for tuning in with us. I'm William Bell with All Things Fulfilled, saying have a very pleasant afternoon and uh, have a great day. Thank you.